Hello everyone, a very good afternoon and welcome to the Straits Times webinar series as part of ST's Through the Lens photo exhibition. I'm David Fogarty, ST's climate change editor, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Today we have, uh, sorry, today we'll be discussing how to join the green dots, that is the vital art of climate and biodiversity communication. We have a wonderful panel joining us today who will show us their own unique and clever ways of explaining climate change and nature and why these issues are so important to all of us and crucially, how both crises are so closely linked. First though, let me share some housekeeping matters. This session will be approximately 45 minutes. For those who have submitted questions ahead of time, thank you. Uh, for those who are joining us via Zoom, do send us your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon on your Zoom screen. The recording of the session will be made available online on the Straits Times website from tomorrow onwards. Now, let me introduce today's panelists. Firstly, we have Ms. Melissa Lowe, a research fellow from the National University of Singapore and a highly regarded expert on energy policy and UN climate negotiations. Welcome. Next, we have Ms. Wu Chiyun, founder of The Weird and the Wild site on Instagram. Chiyun works also as a consultant, uh, fo focusing on uh, risk advisory, sustainability, and climate change. Welcome. And next, we have Ms. Kong Manjing, or MJ, who is uh, co-founder of Just Keep Thinking, a science and nature education channel who has worked with various government and private organisations to educate and communicate effectively. And welcome to you. Now, uh, let's start off with the first question. Um, all three of you are expert um, communicators in your own right and with your own style. Um, I think you can be described as educators and influencers. And I think you've got pretty strong followings, right? <laughs> um, so let's start off with each of you giving us a bit of an idea of, you know, or more of an idea about yourselves and the main way you reach out to people. Um, Mel, how about we start off with you? Thanks, David. Um, hi, I'm Melissa. I am a research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute based at the National University of Singapore. I do energy and climate change policy research over there. I'm also doing a PhD part-time at the NUS Department of Geography at the same time. Um, so I, I basically do my outreach through policy briefs, webinars, um, public talks, podcasts and the like. Uh, I also tend to pen commentaries every now and then. So that's been, been some of the, the ways in which I communicate climate change policy. That's great. And uh, Chiyun, how about you? Yeah, so thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Chiyun. I, uh, I guess I graduated from NUS Environmental Studies and when I was an undergraduate, I created The Weird and Wild on Instagram um, to communicate a lot of the climate science that I was learning in university and all this is to consolidate all the stuff that I was learning about. So I have started it about three to four years ago and I'm still doing that now. But mm. now that I've graduated, I'm also doing like sustainability consulting um, at a consulting firm and yeah, just learning about not just environmental policy, corporate sustainability and still trying to find ways to communicate all of that. Right. Uh, MJ? Uh, thanks for having me here. So uh, I'm MJ. I'm also the co-founder of a local based science and nature channel called Just Keep Thinking, where we share bite-sized knowledge um, in light-hearted manner so that we can reach out to people who are interested and also those who are not interested in nature mm. through the power of social media. So I was once a science teacher, but I have recently transitioned into doing Just Keep Thinking channel for um, like full time. That's great. So let's, um, let's discuss some examples of your work, just to give you know, uh, viewers a, a better sense of how each of you um, approach communications you know, on climate change and biodiversity and linking these, these two crises. So Mel, perhaps um, I, th I think we have some examples here of, yep. of, of what you do. So. Okay, yeah, so um, one of the key enablers of my, my research into climate change and climate change negotiations is really the accreditation to attend the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mm -hmm. And so the National University of Singapore was accredited to attend the Conference of Parties, which happens every year. And you were just in Glasgow, yes, of course, right. yeah. uh, for COP26. Yeah. Uh, the first COP I ever attended was COP15 in 2009, those in Copenhagen. And so since then, NUS has gotten accredited to attend these meetings. So that's one of the key enablers for us to keep uh, track of what's going on at the international negotiations. We also bring students and staff along uh, when we can. Uh, funding, they have to, to actually get themselves, but we, we do accredit these uh, students and staff who want to go and to further their interest in this area. 
uh, while we're at the COP, typically um, if we have the opportunity, we would also organize um, side events. Mm. Uh, we would go around talking to negotiators. And uh, we've been really lucky uh, that the Singapore delegation quite often uh, also arranges to meet with us, uh, both at the ministerial level, uh, at the high level, but also working level staff also quite happy to meet with us um, over at the COP meetings, but also back here in Singapore. And so one of the outreach efforts um, that we do is to give uh, uh, sharing after we come back from COP meetings. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that some of the uh, examples uh, is the uh, so the e ESI where I work, we collaborated with the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law to present an executive program mm -hmm. that we, so we taught uh, um, climate change negotiations. Uh, we also did a couple in 2018 and 2019 um, to youth and educators. So we worked with a number of uh, National University of Singapore groups like uh, Ridgeview Residential College, RVRC. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked with the National Youth Council to mount climate change negotiations training workshops. And that was, was really good, it was oversubscribed. We, we trained about 80 uh, youth and educators over two years. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned earlier during my introduction, there are a few ways in which uh, I have used to communicate uh, climate change policy. The first uh, and the most familiar I am with is policy briefs. So these are short bite-sized analysis. So four page or 2,500 word analysis. Uh, and then I've also been very lucky get, getting opportunities to write for Straits Times, mm. uh, Science Talk, uh, shout out to Audrey, <laughs> and also <laughs> webinars. Uh, again, this was one that we did pre-COP26 last year. Audrey moderated the seminar, yeah. uh, the webinar online. Uh, we've also been invited to Green Pulse, uh, which is a really great platform to share views, short bite-sized views, um, and other uh, podcast channels as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the key things that I, I've been doing as a member of the National Youth Council is to organize Singapore Green Plan conversations and we did a number last year in collaboration with the National Youth Council and those were also extremely well attended. Mm. Uh, we did them across the, the university's intervarsity sessions last year. And so as you can see on the slide here, um, we also work with the National Youth Council to nominate young people to attend uh, the conferences of the parties. Uh, and we nominated two from the Singapore Youth for Climate Action last year to attend Glasgow. And I guess you'll be continuing this work with COP27, hopefully. As much as Egypt I can, yes. Sheikh, yeah. Yeah. yes. So, um, Chiyun, um, you, you've got a different style, I guess, of communication, yes. um, um, certainly on, on Instagram. And I certainly love your, your sort of climate blog comics. Yes. Um, I think you've done a really good job in distilling complex issues or even scary issues and saying, look, don't panic, it's all right. This is what it's all about, right? <laughs> uh, so there was one, re one really good example that I found, which, uh, which we, we may show here, um, of how you explained why COP26 was so, so important to people. Mm -hmm. um, and you, know, you sort of guided them by the hand. I thought that was a very nice way to do that. So perhaps just talk about some of your work. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. And I think it's funny you mentioned the blogs because that character sort of only came up in mid-2020 because I just needed um, something to be talking as though, you know, to represent me in a comical form and also in a way that I don't have to draw faces, hands and legs. So the <laughs> blog was the perfect way. But yeah, I started the, the Weird and Wild on Instagram very specifically because it was very visual and I was a visual learner. So I loved like mind maps, I loved infographics. Mm. It was very hard for me to memorize things of like, um, I don't know, a, a thousand word essay or like textbooks were very difficult for me. Um, and I thought, you know, what if more people could get in touch with climate issues um, through a random blog who's just here telling you it's not that scary, you don't have to read through the whole thing, I've read it, now this is the thousand word in picture form. Hmm. So I started the, the Weird and Wild because friends were really just getting interested and I realised how inaccessible a lot of the information are and I remember thinking to myself um, in my third year of university, like, can you imagine if everybody else knew what I was learning, how much more they'll be interested in things like crabs, in intertidals, and also in issues such as like hydrology and weather patterns. Mm -hmm. So I met a local artist recently called Daryl Xiao, and there was this one phrase that he used that resonated with me, which is to make the boring interesting again. 
and that was what I really wanted to do. So yeah, you know, I communicate climate issues and science with graphics, and I take a lot of reference from people like Mel, yourself, when people write about such important things, or even academics like Dr. Winston Chow. Mm. And I'm lucky to have had an education that allowed me to process some of these things and know what I should be looking for. And then in my head, I guess there's a translator that goes, how do I draw this out then? Yeah, so can I have the next slide? So yeah, I think... Um, oh, there's Winston Chow, yeah. Yes, there's Winston <laughs> Chow right there. Yeah, I think um, it can be very overwhelming even for myself to be reading the news about all sorts of things mm. that are happening. I remember when the IPCC report came out, the, the one I think last year, mm -hmm. I opened up the PDF and it was close to 4,000 page long and I really didn't know how I should be beginning. And everyone was saying this is such an important document, but I didn't get why that was important. And this was me as an interested person already. Do you have to look at the summary for policymakers. Yeah, it's, it's, right. It's, it's, so it's, after it's, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's like reading War and Peace. You know, it's, it'll, yes. it'll, it'll take forever. You know. Exactly. <laughs> so I think if I felt very upset or at least frustrated that if I, as an interested person, couldn't even bring myself to to read that or even the summary report. Mm what more you know, general public who may be hearing about these things but don't really know what it means beyond very catchy headlines sometimes. Mm. So I was hoping to, like you know, MJ, use social media and to break some of these down because these people are probably not going to spend time reading the news on certain yeah. issues. Yeah. Why not have an expert just come tell you exactly mm. what it is? So I've done that for the IPCC report about oceans and carbon and also even issues like rain, inequality, heat, uh, and I guess most recently COP26. And yeah, I, I think that all these issues have nuance and the complexity sometimes get missed in public communications that I just hope to capture with images. Yeah, next slide please. So yeah, I guess the three things that my work kind of revolves around is accessibility, um, playfulness, and color. So like I'm in bright green. I think it's very obvious what my favorite color is. I have green hair. Uh, and I like playing with colors because it lowers the barrier to some of these difficult conversations or topics. And I remember when I was creating the blog, I went to Google what makes something cute. So then, you know, bright, big eyes, separate, uh, or like sometimes close together and mm. in the most ridiculous forms. And I felt that if I can first hook you in with a cute, unassuming blob, hopefully you'll read on till the end about something as yeah. serious as plastic waste on the beach. So that's how all these characters began to take shape. Yeah, uh, next slide. Yeah, so you know, um, beyond comics, I've also started to delve more into science communication. So sometimes I, I go on different podcasts and we're, a few of us are thinking of starting a podcast to just engage with all these issues. Um, I write commentaries uh, ad hoc, I guess, and we are also creating interactive websites to encourage play and I guess interactiveness in science comms. Mm. So yeah, next slide. And yeah, I guess the last thing is, you know, um, I feel like a lot of this work is very collaborative. I don't claim to know all the answers. I just know enough to be able to ask some questions or to find the right resources. But ultimately, science communications requires like everybody's effort to come learn together and to share things that they know. So I've been very fortunate on Instagram to have met such people, you know, like yourself even. And yeah, it's been great fun. So I always love to explore new ways of science comms. And MJ, I think that's the same for you. You, you. You're extremely inventive in the way you, uh, and the mediums you choose to explain, um, particularly around biodiversity. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> even the video about the snail, <laughs> which I thought was- <laughs> Which we will show. Which we will show. So, so over to you. <laughs> right, um, that was interesting. I actually Googled the same thing. How do I make the characters look cute and attract people's mm -hmm. attention? Yeah, cuteness is one of the methods that works brilliantly when it comes to social media. Mm. So, should I play the slides? Of so this is just keep thinking, and yeah, that's my character. <laughs> um, because yeah, like what you mentioned, it's easier if there's you know this figure, this character come you know share with you, you know just like a friend or mm. a neighbor next door. So that is my character in characteristic yellow. While you have green, I have yellow, <laughs> as reflected on our dressing today. Uh, next slide, please. So we are essentially a social media company, so we focus a lot on 
um, hinging on the different social media platforms out there. So we mm. are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and even TikTok. Mm. Yeah, and all the, these social media platforms, they target a different range of audience, requires a different method of communication, mm. which is um, a bit of a headache for me, but it's fun for me at the same time. So yeah, we're, all, we're on all four platforms. Mm. Um, next, please. So one of the key pillars of what our channel do is videos, mainly mm. videos. Uh, next, please. So this is example of a video oh, that I actually did with a PUB. And I got to meet Water Wally and Water Sally. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, we were actually exploring the intertidal area. But at the same time, we discussed PUB's coastal protection efforts. And we really, you know, we conveyed to the audience, you know, what Singapore is facing right now about the threat of rising sea levels and how we are combating the situation and the solution that we've come up with. Oh yeah, that's Water Wally with the sea urchin. <laughs> uh, please don't hold the sea urchin, yeah. Um, I scolded him for doing that. Yes. Uh, next you, slide, please. He got stuck in the mud there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and right, so this is a TikTok video where um, I'm eating, I guess you can, guys can see, you know, a gong gong, which um, is a delicacy in all of our hawker centers. I'm sure some of you have eaten it before. <laughs> but then what they don't realize that these gong gongs, they are pearl conch snails that can be found on our shores as well. Oh. And right there, there's a live gong gong with its eyes staring at you. Yeah. So this is like a fun piece that I made um, for TikTok. Because the TikTok audience prefer something a bit more lighthearted. But hopefully it also makes a connection that you know the food that we eat actually comes from somewhere and mm. for gong gongs you can actually find it right you know at our shores. Mm. Next please. And this is also another TikTok video, but um, it's a slightly it's addressing a more serious issue. Mm. So on our intertidal walks, we actually do come across animals that you know unfortunately got hooked into you know fishing lines, fishing hooks, and we're trying so hard to remove it. Yeah, so we do inject the fun and entertain, entertaining element, but we also try to you know, talk about issues that should be addressed um, yeah, with regards to you know, climate change and plastic pollution and all, on all our media platforms. Next, please. Um, so another key pillar of our channel is graphics. Uh, next, please. So yeah, um, we also like to show through visuals, just like mm -hmm. Tune, um, there's a lot of colors, and these are much light-hearted um, topics, you know, and we try to mince it out as much as we can for the mainstream audience. So this is about bird migration. So it's not just about, you know, random birds appearing and everyone flocking. There's a reason why they migrate and mm. what are the threats that they are facing. Uh, and yes, that is, um, uh, if you guys can get the reference in the middle, Penguin, that would be great for you, Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> Next, please. Uh, and this is um, a collaboration with EMA where we talk about our four switches um, because you know everyone knows about the four national tabs but not necessarily the four switches so we try to showcase in an in infographic <coughs> format you know and why we use natural gas which is actually a question that you know a lot of people ask you know why not coal and why mm. natural gas so other than the fact that uh, it emits it's less polluting not say it is not pollution it's less polluting but there's also various other reasons as to why we are using natural gas mm. and yeah and my and i'm just everywhere <laughs> there <laughs> next please and this is an, another piece that um, I had the Instagram audience in mind because I, I feel that they want something a bit more uh, with an emotional attachment to it. And it was a topic that I, I've been trying to tackle, you know, talking about climate change issues mm. and how can I convey the gravity of the situation. So I actually used the story of the, the myth of a boiling frog. Mm. Uh, next, please. You know, to show that we are in this boiling pot and it seems like everything's all right, but actually we, the heat is slowly increasing and mm. we are not doing enough to bring it down. So yeah, it was, I think it was, well, was, was one of our best pieces also, I was very happy about it. Mm. <laughs> Next, please. Um, so yeah, so that's our, the core of Just Keep Thinking. Um, most of it is digital, it's online, but we are also doing things offline. So one of, it, one of which is our, the nature adventures that we bring our participants on. Uh, Next, please. So yeah, uh, I've been doing intertidal guides um, seven to eight times a month where I bring mm. participants, families, um, even groups of teachers out, you know, to actually explore into tidal area. Mm. And it's really interesting because most of them are people who have watched my channel. Mm. So it feels as though they are on a real life, just keep thinking episode with me. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next please. And we also have virtual wildlife adventures. Right. So it was really cute, you know, the, the kids, 
on the right hand side, they are all doing the just keep sticking. <laughs> The, the, uh, this action that I do at the end of my videos, they were all doing it with me. And while we have some fun stuff for this adventure, you know, we spot some animals, we also um, talk about important issues such as plastic pollution, mm -hmm. climate change. Yeah. Next, please. And last but not least, um, I've, um, trying to, I've been into more, giving more sharing sessions uh, because I think people are getting more interested as to how social media can be used as a tool to communicate science, nature, you know, and wildlife. So different webinars, um, podcasts, and uh, I've been participating in community discussions and programs, you know, conducted by these wonderful uh, NGOs, organizations, and nature groups out there. So mm -hmm. a big shout out to them. Yeah, so that is That's the great. core of what I do. That's fantastic. Um, I think you've answered partly this, this question that I'm going to ask um, in terms of how each of you could explain how your work is important to Singapore. I think you've kind of you've, you've explained that. Um, but what I would like to ask is maybe elaborate a little bit more about the link between climate change and biodiversity. I don't think people always get that link. Mm. They think that's separate, right? But it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. So... Um, a lot of my work does not really have a link with biodiversity, yeah. but uh, it's because of the work that Tuyun and MJ do. I think that you see the relevance with climate change, energy, you know, the combustion of fossil fuels mm. impacting the natural environment right, in Singapore. And so I think collaboration and partnership is really important. So sometimes when I put out information through the, the policy briefs, which is very serious along the spectrum, mm. I think it's probably one of the more serious type of uh, communication channels. Yeah. Um, it's also because of my work as a researcher. Um, I, I really do enjoy uh, the Instagram posts. I'm not on TikTok yet, uh, but I really do enjoy the Instagram posts. I think it, it, it injects something uh, very lively about uh, something that's very serious, like climate change and um, destruction of natural habitats. Um, but so what I'll say is that I, I, I really appreciate that when people take the work that uh, we do as, as researchers mm -hmm. and translate it into something that's more accessible, more playful and lively to, to other audiences. So we have to work together. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I think for me, the links, are, it's hard because I think we all in this work recognize the, the links between the two. And sometimes when narratives try to paint them differently, then we have to do the work of what I call re-education mm. to say that climate change and biodiversity are very, very interlinked. And sometimes because it's so abstract, you need to find pockets of I guess, issues, you need to jump on certain hypes to say, hey, these two things are not so separate after all. And for me, I find that I struggle doing that in posts, like Instagram posts. Sometimes I have to make use of Instagram stories to really talk about these issues. And the most recent one I did is about plastic pollution on our beaches. Mm. And I was cleaning up with a friend who is very interested in plants. And he was telling me about how, you know, when we clear all these things, we are actually giving breathing space for a lot of the mangroves to grow. And I thought that capturing that on Instagram stories was the best way because it's my entire thought process throughout it all. Right. But it's not something that you can do very often too. Mm. Yeah. Right. Um, actually for me, I started out in the biodiversity scene. So, you know, just gaining my knowledge and experience uh, in this scene. And even the nature community, there's always this unofficial and unintentional segregation, you know, between the nature, biodiversity, wildlife people and the sustainability and climate change people. Yeah, but we're, we're bringing the gaps now like, in recent years. Mm. So th that was very interesting because I think for many of us out there, if we ask, you know, is climate change linked to biodiversity? We would say yes. You know, mm -hmm. if there's a true or false question, we would, we would circle through a uh, true, sorry. Um, but if we are able to give an example, I think we, you know, most of us would probably say like polar bears because that's the narrative that yeah. Yeah. Uh, has been fed to us since yeah. young. But if we narrow it down to the local context, um, we may not see it that way, we may not see the link because it's not that apparent, mm. but there is, it exists and it's just, it's not right, happening right in our own backyard or it's happening in ways that it's in an indirect form that you do not know that it's linked to climate change. Mm. So um, for one example I can share is about the coral reefs yes. in our region. Yeah. So the ones, uh, especially in Sister Islands Marine Park, uh, Pusu Island and Pulau Hantu, they just experienced a mass bleaching event in mm. mid-2020. Yeah, uh, it was to the point where it was an emergency case, you know, like surveillance mm. has to be there to check out the corals. And it happened right after the third 
the report of a third mass bleaching event that occurred in the Great Barrier Reef. Yes, that's right. Mm. Yeah, in just five years. Mm -hmm. So coral reefs, they are one of the most temperature sensitive animals mm. that can show like immediate signs of distress when the temperatures are out of their range and mm. they are also one of the animals that are at highest one of the highest risk when it comes to the impact of climate change yes and you know i understand that people don't get to visit the coral reefs and they don't get to see the changes but there are also changes happening uh, right in our own backyard so i recently went birding and it was very cute you know the uncles were the burglars were talking to me with their big bazooka cameras <laughs> and they're like Aga, how come the migratory birds keep appearing earlier and earlier? Oh. Yeah, and then I was like, Uncle, I don't know, but I'll go back and do my homework and I'll come back to you. So I went back <laughs> and I did my homework. And there was recent research uh, just published last, late last year that shows that the timing of bird migrations uh, are being shifted um, mm. substantially mm -hmm. and it has links to climate change, you know, perhaps the seasonal changes in the weather and how it affects their food source. Mm. Yeah, and the report also stated that the body size of birds are getting smaller, the wingspans are getting larger. Yes, so you know, that actually you know, made the link in my head as well. And if we want a more relatable example, right, there's actually this one particular animal that is thriving and doing well on the onset of climate change. Can anyone guess? Is it the otters? Ah, uh, no, <laughs> no. I'm not sure, but no, that wasn't. Is, a, is it a vector? Mosquitoes? Oh, mosquito. yeah. Mosquitoes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So with increasing temperatures, the mm. lifespan of mosquitoes, they actually shorten. And what happens is that increases their reproductive rate. And mm. that means more mosquitoes around. And that translates to higher risk of malaria in our country, which is what we are seeing in recent years. Mm. Uh, recent years sorry. So yes, um, climate change and biodiversity, they are very much interlinked. They can impact one another and they affect our lives and our life and our health and our livelihoods as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, from that it may seem like there's nothing going on, but if you just take all these symptoms from these various issues and you piece it together, mm -hmm. you get to see a bigger picture where climate change is the core of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I so. feel like I'm watching a just keep thinking video right <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's how I hope to you know, share. It's not about the direct impact that you see, but it's about the little things that's happening around mm. you and they all have links to climate change. Yeah, yeah. Mm. it does all add up. So um, now I need to do some housework, uh, more housekeeping, I should say, uh, <laughs> not housework. <laughs> I'll be vacuuming next. Um, <laughs> now, before we continue, I would like to tell you about the uh, ongoing Through the Lens exhibition brought to you by the Straits Times, which is being held at the National Museum of Singapore. I think you can see some footage now. Uh, Through the Lens is a celebration of the best in visual and interactive journalism. Uh, the, in the exhibition explores the impact of global climate change on Singapore and showcases how even a small country can do its part to tackle the challenges of this crisis. It features some excellent examples of science communication too. Um, Through the Lens is being held concurrently with the World Press Photo Exhibition at the museum and celebrates the most powerful, provocative, poignant images from around the world. Uh, the, the exhibition runs until February the 6th. And I also want to give a special mention or shout out to uh, last week's Through the Lens webinar featuring highly talented artists from the Straits Times. Uh, the webinar discussed how art is an effective way of communicating ab abstract con concepts such as climate change uh, to make it more palatable for the local audience. Uh, it features the work of ST art editor Lee Hupkane, uh, Bryant Lynn, Manuel Francisco and Billy Kerr. Uh, the discussion was moderated by ST's science and environment correspondent uh, Audrey Tan. Please do take a look as they discuss their work including climate cartoons and animations. Uh, the link to the show is in the Zoom chat I believe. Now returning to our discussion, um, I'd like to explore how each of you started your communications work. Um, what was the trigger and what keeps driving you? Uh, I think you're, you're first, Mel. <laughs> okay, um, so I mentioned earlier that my first COP was COP15. And at the time, uh, we went with a small group of youth, uh, 12 of us went from Singapore, we were self-funded. We went to the meeting with no background of what a COP was, how it worked. We were completely overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back, I was just about to graduate from my degree in uh, geography at NUS. And I... Um, <coughs> wasn't quite sure what I would do, but I ended up doing uh, research and blogging uh, for the 
for the NGO that brought us there to, to COP15. And subsequently, I joined NUS as a research uh, researcher at the time. And I, I kept on doing the same thing, just sort of breaking down complex negotiations, uh, whether it's the agenda items to what was being discussed by different groups, uh, like the EU, um, big coalitions like the G77 in China, what were they saying? People were always interested in what Singapore was doing also at the negotiations. And I would try and convey that um, in, in short, bite-sized pieces. Mm. And I, I found that over the years, one of the best ways to do it is through policy briefs because um, it's 2,500 words, it's long enough for you to get your point across, but mm -hmm. it's also short enough to capture people's attentions. Um, but I, I have found that over the years, attention span has gotten a lot shorter. Um, if you can't read anything, like I think two or three scrolls on your, on your mobile phone, you, you lose people's attentions yeah. right away. So yeah. uh, we've, been, we've been also exploring social media recently at, at our institute. Um, but yeah, so that's how I started. I think it's, uh, and how, what keeps me going is really uh, the strong interest in uh, what people do at the negotiations, right? Mm. So there's, there's still that sense of mystery about what actually happens uh, uh, behind the, the negotiating uh, door, right? The, the, when the rooms are, are closed. Uh, so as a, as a member of the non-governmental organization, NUS is actually listed as a non-governmental organization. We go there and observe and we are free to translate um, what, what happens based on our observation back to a local or regional or global audience. Mm. So that's what keep, keeps me going anyway. Uh, it's, I think it's important work because uh, not everybody gets to go to these yeah. meetings. Mm. They're usually yeah. quite expensive to, to go there. Um, and the last few years has been held in Europe and because of COVID-19, um, the pandemic also has, has restricted a lot of movement. And mm. so I think putting out information uh, and, and especially where representation matters, right? If you, if you read a piece of analysis that comes from someone that's born and bred, I guess, in Singapore, uh, from someone that looks and, and sounds like you, generally, I think, comes across is slightly more accessible, mm. um, at least based on my observation. Okay, that's great. Jiyun, what, uh, what mm. I think you, you kind of explained a bit earlier yeah. how you started. Um, well, what keeps driving you? Do, do you feel that people are sort of getting to understand the issues better? Are they getting better educated? Or do you still think that there's lots of re-education that's needed? <laughs> yeah, I would say that it's a mix, right? Because everyone's baseline on sustainability or even science, it's very different. Mm. So it's either someone can really be very deep into it and those people have their own avenues of learning about biodiversity, for example. But sometimes, you know, as I grow with the environmental movement and sometimes my thinking has shifted, I also have to remember or remind myself that there are people who have maybe just started on the envir entire environmental journey. Mm -hmm. um, some people may just be hearing about IPCC or COP26 or even carbon for the first time. So I've had to balance a bit of both because sometimes I get questions whenever I talk about, let's say, plastic pollution, right? And someone still, you know, at this time asks me, is recycling even a good idea? Mm. And I know that the recycling conversation has like its peak and trough. So yeah, I think very being very mindful about where people are and mm. knowing that you still have quite a lot of people to bring along this journey keeps me going because I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's important that I repeat myself. So, and I think exploring visuals is still something that um, still has a lot of space to play with. You talked about interactive journalism mm. at the exhibition, right? I feel that it's still very new. People are still finding best, the best ways to be talking about an issue. I have seen so many art exhibitions or um, I think the latest one was the Waste Refinery at National Design Centre. There are so many ways to communicate that and I think that creative element excites me a lot and I totally agree with Mel about how people's attention spans are getting shorter mm. and with that I worry about us having to be too um, reductionist with some of the content on climate change because people ask me what are five things I can do about climate change right and trying to say oh don't use plastic don't use the air con or walk I mean have you tried walking in Singapore's weather it's it's ridiculous so Help, hoping to add more nuance mm. and try new ways to keep people's attention and retaining that attention to me is like my next few exploratory areas because I don't think people 
um, are losing attention span, you just need something to keep their attention for a longer period of time. So I think that excitement and that possibility keeps me going. That's great. MJ, what's, what's the secret of your, <laughs> your drive? <laughs> um, well, for me, um, personally, I started off, you know, like doing my undergraduate degree in NUS. And I've always noticed that there's this gap between um, what we call the, you know, the mainstream audience and the issues surrounding nature, climate and biodiversity. Mm. So that gap was very apparent to me. Yeah, and sometimes I will test my friends, you know, like who are not into these issues and be like, hey, do you know, uh, do you think we have crocodiles in Singapore? And they'll be like, I thought we have alligators. Uh, <laughs> is it Pasir Ris Park? And I was like, oh. <laughs> it was very interesting though, but to see them, you know, respond in the point of view from, you know, the mainstream audience, you know, how mm. there's still so much for them to learn. Mm. So that has always been a question in my mind. How do I actually reach out to these group of audience, which I think makes up a significant proportion out there. And whenever I go to you know, discussion forums, programs you know, about nature or sustainability and climate change, it's generally always the same few people. Like, but I want to see more, I want to see people who are not interested in these topics to come in and listen as well. So you know, what better way to do it than through social media, which has the power to reach you know, a wide range of audience. So I was lucky enough to meet my co-founder, Ray, Shout out. <laughs> and he's a videographer. Mm. So he noticed that I've, you know, just being me myself, I like to you know, talk about anything science related mm. whenever I'm out, you know, like, hey, this cup, this bird, this computer, do you know how it works? And mm. such stuff. So it, like, it's like a small little video playing in his mind. So he pitched to me in the idea and uh, I was on board with it. You know, I was, okay, let's do this like a fun little side project. So we created our channel, we posted our videos, uh, our content, and mm. the rest is history. Yeah. So it's really challenging hmm. because not only it's not just about you know researching, mincing down the facts, creating graphics or videos of um, the content that we try to put out. It's also how we can make it entertaining so that people will actually get to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really the most challenging part, you know, of the whole creative process. But it's also the part which is most fun and what keeps me driving, you know, because there's always a new challenge when it comes to creating a new content. Hmm. Yeah. Like how can I make this the best? possible way to communicate, communicate to my audience, you know, what are the tools that I can use, what did I learn from it. And while researching on these topics, I get to learn a lot myself. And I get to learn from the other people who are doing great work out there. Mm. So I actually see this like a, it's like a big community. Mm. So perhaps there, you know, uh, I get a lot of the audience, but if they want to learn more, they can slowly flow to other channels. Yeah, and even though the people flowing there might, you know, drop, you know, as they move on, but at least we are getting some people and the flow is, is there, you know, like there's always new people coming in, learning more, and they will go on and to, you know, to learn more about deeper issues from other channels. Yeah. So that's how I see, you know, how science communication works. Mm -hmm. And that really keeps me going to know that people are learning and gaining a lot from my channel and to know that, you know, my content has certain meaning, certain value inside and the efforts that I do is worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's always lots of new stuff to learn, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so if I could add something, I think there are two additional challenges to what uh, both Chiyun and MJ said. The first is to how to remain credible while trying to be entertaining and capturing mm -hmm. attention. Mm -hmm. And the second is what happens if you want to be a moderate, mm -hmm. right? So being a moderate sometimes with the spectrum of views out there is not as entertaining or not as, uh, it doesn't capture as much attention if you, if you were, you know, showing some kind of extreme view about a particular policy or a particular um, issue, right? So in order to balance your views, sometimes you just have to explain and then people might, some activists might think that you're a sellout mm. and um, that worries me a lot. And it's a lot of additional emotional labor going into mm. the thought process yeah. and how to communicate as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. So <laughs> 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 got to keep follow that middle line. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> Um, so this has been a great discussion. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. So uh, we're going to turn to, s to some questions. Um, I see a question here. Um, this is from uh, Frederick Tan. Um, the impacts of the climate crisis, such as melting glaciers, uh, may, make one, uh, may make one feel pessimistic. Is it too late to reverse climate change? Who wants to, to take that one on? It's not too late. <laughs> um, I mean, even though the science might be, um, and the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel cl uh, on Climate Change, is always saying that we, the window is closing um, and the science is always getting worse. 
But I think that we, we must remain hopeful mm. that we can um, do our best um, and try to reverse the tide, uh, as it were, <laughs> literally, <laughs> as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, small plug to the, co the IG Live conversation I had with Dr. Winston Chow, I posed him the exact question, right? When IPCC came out, this whole code red on climate change or biodiversity was making, the, they were making headlines. And I asked Dr. Chow, is this really the end of everything? Like, what does this really mean? Are we doomed? And mm. he said, no, there is, you can have, up to you whether you want to have hope, but you need to have faith that the science is clear. We just need action mm. in order to reverse some of the worst impacts. And the quote that stuck with me is, you know, every, I guess, every degree, what was what it? Yeah, every degree avoided is disaster averted. So mm. it matters mm -hmm. even if things are going really bad to minimize how bad that can be. So mm. I don't think it's too late. Yeah. Mm. Are okay. you feeling pessimistic or optimistic? Um, definitely optimistic. <laughs> we, ha we have to be, you know, that's, yeah. that's my mantra, you know, with the yellow color. So <laughs> the beauty about, you know, nat um, sorry, nature, biodiversity and climate change, right? The link is that the solution can be found in biodiversity mm -hmm. itself. Mm. So um, when biodiversity is thriving and is doing well, the ecosystems are working, they can help to turn the tide with regards to the climate change crisis. So we know that um, the trees and the plants are doing a great job, but we also have our blue carbon mm. Mm. ecosystems, mm -hmm. our mangroves, our coral reefs, our seagrass, mm. uh, seagrasses in which Singapore has all of it. Mm. Um, they, you not know, altogether pound for pound, they can actually store up to 10 times more carbon yeah. than our tropical rainforest. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I feel that, you know, as long as we combine the nature-based climate solutions along with our man-made technologies, but also more importantly, if we recognize the urgency of the situation and we are willing to change our mindsets and change the behaviors in our lifestyle, mm. we can turn this around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. so we should have hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, another uh, question, this is from um, Gretel Seek, uh, sorry, Gretel Seat. Um, any advice for people who are starting out in biodiversity or environmental work? Uh, who wants to start off on that one? Starting out, let's see. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Yeah, we are welcome. And I think it's great to always welcome people into the work that, that we do, into the community, because there's a lot of work to be done. Mm. So it's always great to have more people and to have new interests because there's just a spectrum of what they can do and what people can do in general. So be it, you know, you're a journalist, designer, artist, scientist, uh, researcher, policy person. Yeah, this space is for you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I personally know <laughs> this um, person who posed the question and she has been actively participating a lot of the activities that are organized out there that is available for the public. So the first step is to actually get to know about what's going on around us. Mm. And you know, once you've taken the first step, uh, you realize that a lot of the doors are open and the community is always very welcoming for you to learn more, to participate more and to join us in doing what we can you know, to prevent this crisis. And also, you know, for start, if people who are just starting out with biodiversity, just take a walk at the park. Mm. You know, so I actually did a video with um, speaker Tan Chuan Singh where mm. we just walked along this big Sigap canal, which is a longkang, uh, like just a big drain. And there were so many biodiversity around. There was a pair of kingfishers that built its nest along in mm. the holes that's along mm. the drain. Mm. So, you know, just by appreciating what's around you, that I think can inculcate the sense, you know, of this love for nature and wildlife and appreciate what we have right now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would probably say stay curious, keep an open mind, um, and when times are tough, just keep fighting the good fight. Uh, I, I was on a panel recently that talked about eco-anxiety, and yeah, uh, the, I know there are many youth and many activists that are feeling a lot of stress and anxiety over the climate crisis, and um, I think it's important to take time to also, at times, turn off the news and turn, you know, if you can, right, mm. turn off the news and, and just try and calm yourself because uh, we're in for the long haul. Uh, and so it's important to be able to, to uh, think about how you can address your emotions vis-a-vis -vis, like what's happening around the world. Mm. And I know a lot of people are upset with, with newsy 
uh, things like the, the forest fires uh, and then what else was disasters happening all around mm. the world. It's very hard to turn off your communication devices. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that's the other end of the spectrum, which is what happens when there's too much information, mm. too much being communicated and thrown at you that we now have to deal with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, welcome <laughs> to the club, Bretto. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, we're, we're all here for you if, if you are uh, keen to talk and talk through how to get over or get through eco-anxiety. Yeah. Um, next question. Um, I think this will be our last question. Um, this is from uh, Mohammed Hussein um, Sainuddin. How is Singapore dealing with the threat of rising sea levels? Um, well. Well. We there's a lot of research going on. <laughs> yeah. <I know>. yes. <laughs> there's, a lot of research. there's a lot of research yeah. going on. Um, yeah. uh, he can actually if you watch my PUB video, yeah. uh, even though it's just like a it's a very simplified version. Um, in the past, we used to you know reclaim more land, building more seawalls, like really harsh structures, man-made structures, to just you know prevent the sea level from reaching inland. Um, so that was one of the methods that Singapore used in the past. Mm -hmm. But you know, as we realized, you know, land reclamation it has devastating effect, uh, devastating effects on our biodiversity, mm. and mm. yeah, we are really losing a lot of our land and what is precious to us. So now, um, I think the mindset has shifted as well. There's a new nature-based um, center for climate change solutions that's being set up where scientists are trying to find out how we can use the power of nature which has, you know, through the years of evolution, perfected its own way of efficiently capturing carbon and storing them. Mm. And also, um, with, in relation to climate, uh, sorry, the sea level rise. So now our mangroves, our sea grasses, they are very efficient in not only capturing carbon, but also preventing and slowing down the waves. Yeah. And that is, that would definitely help with the sea level rise issues. Mm. And even when we have built man-made structures, we are trying to modify it in a way that you know, the biodiversity can come back to it. So we are combating both sea level rise and even though we may lose some of our land or we have already lost mm -hmm. some of our biodiversity and land, we are trying to restore the ecosystem back. Mm. So you know, planting seawalls along the, you know, the stone revertments, you know, the, sorry, smaller seawalls, tiles, seawall tiles, you know, they have different shapes so that it can recruit a lot more biodiversity yeah. onto mm -hmm. the seawall tiles. Yeah. Yeah. So we are enhancing this man-made structures at the same time. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, I think, uh, unless you guys um, have got any final comments, um, I, I think we were supposed to wrap up and have a 30 minute, so a 30 second um, comment from each of you just on the top line messages from each of you from, from, from today's discussion. So perhaps let's finish with that. Um, <laughs> out, of our, out of our discussion, um, um, please give us your top line message on what we've discussed. So go okay, on. Uh, well, yeah, so I think that communicating climate change policy is really important. We need more people doing so. Um, and I would say keep the message simple as much as possible. For me, I think communications on climate change is evolving. You see more corporations also trying to jump on this bandwagon to communicate their own goals. So. To me, keeping that nuance um, and knowing what narratives are being put out there is very important. Mm. So learning to be critical about what are they saying or what are they really saying um, is going to be the next challenge for us. Yeah, I think for all of us here, we sort of are trying, we are trying to achieve the same goal to communicate and share knowledge with everyone. So it would be great if everyone can just you know, stop for a moment, think about the issues that's occurring around us, think about the whys, the hows. Mm. Is this really truly helping the environment or not? And think about the ways that we can protect this biodiversity and our earth so that it can continue to be around for generations to come. So yeah, just keep thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, a perfect way to end. So thank you very much, uh, Melissa, chi and MJ uh, for joining us today. Uh, it was a really, really good discussion. Um, and thanks to our audience for joining us too. And thank you for everyone. Um, stay tuned, uh, sorry, stay informed and, and stay tuned, I guess. Uh, keep healthy and stay safe. <laughs>